What kind of world do I want to live in? I think about this question a lot. For our generation and for specifically my group of people, which is refugees, the circumstances might dismantle any vision of the future that we have. You're trying to rebuild, you're trying to make a future for yourself, and then the climate related disaster comes and you start again. It's not about how it's affecting you now, it's about how it's affecting you your entire life. First step to understand is that we're all a part of it. None of us are going to be left out by the crisis. We're at a stage where if we don't act now, really there won't be very much left. There are generations that will never see certain things that we grew up seeing in real life. We have to start treating this like the emergency it is. To achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, we have to go from an intention to a serious commitment. Business leaders really need to rethink how they conduct their business and invest in creating systems that are climate friendly. I would like to see is accountability. Structures being put in place where countries aren't just asked to do something, but they're kept accountable to the decisions that they make. There has to be that strong collaboration between government, between corporations, between youth activists to drive change forward. The world I would want to live in is a world where imagining the future is not a privilege. I want to live in a world where people do not give up on hope, hope that a positive change is possible. The fact that you're listening today means that you are willing to make a change. everyone. My name is Jane Nelson and it is my very great pleasure to welcome our panelists and our viewers to this important discussion on galvanizing country-led pathways for food, which we're having the day before the United Nations hosts its first ever Food Systems Summit, where the international community will be coming together around a shared agenda of delivering food systems that are healthy for people and healthy for the planet. The leadership challenge we all face is clear. It's compelling and it's urgent. As the United Nations Secretary General said yesterday, we face the greatest cascade of crises in our lifetime. The climate crisis, the COVID-19 crisis, the crisis of growing conflict and inequality, and there can be absolutely no doubt that one of the most important pathways yeah, for tackling yeah, yeah. these crises yeah. is strengthening yeah. our food yeah. systems yeah. and ensuring that our food yeah. systems yeah. are more inclusive, that they're more sustainable, more resilient, and more healthy and nutritious. And so what type of bold action is needed to strengthen our food systems. In the lead up to the Food Systems Summit, an enormous amount of, been of work has been done around the world, including over 1,500 national food systems dialogues that have happened at national and local places in, uh, around the globe, bringing together policymakers, business leaders, consumers, farmers, youth activists, community organizers, around the question of what type of future do we want for food systems? And I think one of the strongest messages that has come out of all the preparation is the critical importance of country-level leadership, country priority setting, and country pathways, owned very much by national governments, but with all the other stakeholders around the table as part of the agenda. 
And as of this morning, 93 countries have released their own sort of specific pathways for their view of the transformation of their food system. And although each pathway is unique, one of the common themes through all of them is the crucial importance of new models of partnership and coalitions in order to drive more uh, sustainable, resilient, and inclusive, and healthy and nutritious food systems. And it's those types of partnerships that we're going to be focusing on in our panel discussion. One example of such a partnership is the Food Action Alliance, which is an initiative that brings together public and private partners, both globally and at the level of specific countries and value chains and flagship initiatives, aiming to mobilize resources, finances, and coordination to make these initiatives more effective. And just this week, as part of the Sustainable Development Impact Summit, the Food Action Alliance has launched a new report um, about multi-stakeholder coalitions for food systems transformation, drawing on over 10 years of experience of some of the things that work and what doesn't work at the country level, and, and a call to action for new models of partnership at the country level. And we have a fantastic uh, group of panelists to share with us their priorities and, and examples of, of country-led uh, food transformation. Um, first of all, Dr. Agnes Kalibata, who is the Special Envoy for the UN Food System Summit. Um, secondly, His Excellency, the Minister of Agriculture from Colombia, um, Mr. Rodolfo Zea. Mr. Gilbert Humbu, who is the President of the International Fund for Agricultural Development, IFAD. Good to have you with us, Gilbert. Pilar Cruz, the Chief Sustainability Officer at Cargill. And Jay Schroff, the CEO of UPL. So thank you all for being with us today. Before we dive into the panel, I also have pleasure in um, introducing the, His Excellency, the Deputy Prime Minister of Vietnam, Mr. Pham Bing Ming, who will make some opening keynote remarks. Over to him. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank the World Economic Forum for inviting me to address this summit. As the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change have exacerbated the weakness and shortcomings in the global food system, Countries need to strengthen partnership to promote the sustainability and adaptability of national food system in the new norm. Sustainable agriculture and food security are among the pillars of Vietnam's socio-economic development strategy for 2021 to 2030, in which we prioritize the development of eco-farming, large-scale, high-tech, low-emission, and climate resilient agriculture. And we are committed to the transitions to a transparent, accountable, and sustainable food system. For further governizing country led pathways to food, I wish to propose the following areas of cooperation. First, we must maintain stable and seamless agricultural supply chains globally. Countries need to minimize unnecessary barriers to food production and export, enhance value chain connectivity, promote e-commerce, and reform the system of origin traceability, logistics, transport, and quality control. Vietnam wishes to collaborate with all stakeholders to promote agriculture and fishery exports thus moving Vietnam upward in the regional and global agricultural supply chains. Second, the green and digital transformation of agriculture is an urgent need. Therefore, financial, technological, and capacity building assistance for developing countries is critical for the transitions to more sustainable and climate-resilient food systems. Vietnam stands ready to become a food innovation center in Asia, and we will continue to actively join initiatives on innovation, digital transformation, and environmental protections in the agricultural sector. Third, it is imperative to further strengthen platforms for partnership and cooperation in sustainable agriculture and to encourage the participation and support of all actors, particularly through PPP projects. 
Vietnam is among the original members of the Partnership for Sustainable Agriculture within the WEP, a partnership that could serve to be a model of preference in building partnerships in this area. Fourth, given the strong urgencies of containing the pandemic and promoting sustainable recovery, we stress the importance of equitable access to vaccines. The international community should also accelerate cooperation in the manufacturing of vaccines and treatment drugs in this regard. Vietnam is committed to working closely with partners around the world in the fight against COVID-19 and on the path to a sustainable and inclusive recovery, including green and sustainable agriculture. Thank you. Thank you very much to His, His Excellency, and I think a very, very important connection he made there between sustainable agriculture and food security on the one hand, and effective public health interventions, you know, specifically in this case, vaccines, but, but you know, public health um, and, and nutrition on, on the other hand. And the link also, and crucial importance of digital platforms to, um, you know, to, to, to help us as well. Um, I'd like to now um, start, um, Dr. Kalibata, with you, and first of all, just acknowledge and say thank you for your remarkable leadership over many, many years, but um, you know, particularly your leadership in the, the lead up to the, the UN Food System Summit. Um, this obviously is an, an incredible opportunity to put food much more at the center as a priority for the Sustainable Development Goals. And it would be great if you could get us going, sort of sharing what your top priorities are, you know, particularly at the country level, for the summit. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. And really, thank you for walking this journey with us, coming this far. We have one day to go to the summit, so we are really- um, Agnes, excited. can you, uh, we can't hear you, so if you can, a little quiet. I don't know if it's just me. Okay. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? <clears throat> it's better, yes. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. Very good. So I was, um, I was uh, again, appreciating um, the support we've got from all of you and coming this far. And going straight to the very question you're asking, you know, how do we ensure that, um, that we come through I think we've seen a number of things. Number one, we, we've been working on ensuring that there's a shift in the mindset that we stop looking at food and food systems from a perspective of, of um, ending hunger, dealing with diets, the challenge of diets, or even dealing with the challenge of climate change, that we actually look at, at food in the totality that it presents itself as a system and, and start working like that. So that has been a major focus of the work we are doing. The next bit is, of course, ambition. Is it possible to actually raise ambition as we work with the food system to ensure that we can see the change we want to see? And this has been captured in what we are calling the means of implementation when it comes to how we, <clears throat> how we deliver against food systems. It looks at how we mobilize finances. It looks at how those finances will, would transform into political instruments or political pr policy frameworks that get implemented. But it also looks at how we are ready to take on innovation. How do we innovate and continue ensuring that we are using innovation to change how we move to go, how we go forward? And then the last two things would be around inclusivity. How do we ensure that everything we are doing, we keep we, we are coordinating well across sectors, but also we are bringing in all stakeholders because they have something to offer. And then how do we build partnerships, which is what you started with? the whole uh, coalitions or the coalition we are talking about is a recognition that no single partner can deliver on this alone that we need to come together around areas that are very critical to us delivering against the sdgs and against an improved uh, or transforming food system that we need to come together around those areas so if we can form partnerships that ensure that we are coming through together in areas where individuals, individual countries, individual uh, uh, nations can't do it alone, then we will possibly be able to, to bend the curve that we've been looking to bend in, in this food system transition that we are looking for. 
Dr. Pell, about. And I think your point, you're particularly about inclusivity. You know, how are we much more intentional in both policy making on the, you know, the, the business side as well? Um, you know, to be clear, who are the stakeholders? Who are the most vulnerable? Um, you know, both producers, farmers, consumers uh, along food value chains, and how do they have a voice and a, and a, and a, you know, a place at the table um, as we build these partnerships and, and policy priorities. And coming to public policy priorities, I'd, I'd like to bring in now um, His, His Excellency, the Minister of Agriculture, uh, Mr. Zaya. Um, Colombia, you and your colleagues have already demonstrated great leadership of national priority setting around food systems. And it would be great to sort of hear your, your insights on um, you know, what are some of the actions you've taken at the country level and um, you know, what do you see as some of the priorities. And to our viewers, um, the minister will be um, sharing his comments in Spanish and translation um, should be available on your screens. Your Excellency, over to you. Bueno, muchas gracias. Y un saludo cordial a todos los colegas y personas que nos acompañan en este panel y que nos están viendo. Eh, desde Colombia hemos hecho una política de seguridad alimentaria partiendo desde las regiones. Para eso se constituyó la Comisión Intersectorial de Seguridad Alimentaria y Nutricional, CISAN, y estamos tramitando una ley que permita que la seguridad alimentaria sea también soberanía alimentaria. ¿Esto en qué consiste? En que lo que se consuma en las regiones de Colombia sea lo que las personas están acostumbrados a consumir históricamente y a través de la investigación y la ciencia, como se ha venido trabajando con eh, eh, la Alianza Biodiversity CIAT y también con Agrosavia, poder fortificar estos alimentos de manera natural y de producción orgánica, de tal forma que las personas puedan mejorar su alimentación con lo que están acostumbrados a consumir históricamente. También se ha hecho una inclusión de las mujeres rurales y tenemos eh, programas como oportunidades pacíficas en el Pacífico colombiano donde estamos apoyando la cadena productiva de estas mujeres para tener alimento de calidad. Todo esto buscando que el país pueda mejorar en un futuro en productividad, pero de una manera sostenible con el ambiente. Y para eso hoy tenemos alianzas con el Ministerio de Ambiente para producir conservando y conservar produciendo y poder cumplir con metas del gobierno del presidente Iván Duque como reducir eh, el, los gases de efecto invernadero en un 51% al 2030, poder dejar sembrados 180 millones de árboles y poder llegar a 180 mil hectáreas con sistemas silvopastoriles y de ganadería regenerativa sostenible que eh, puedan convertir la ganadería en Colombia en una actividad que pueda capturar CO2. De esa manera, trabajamos en productividad con tecnología, investigación y ciencia para mejorar la alimentación de los colombianos y poder llegar al mundo. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Your Excellency. And I think you know, four sort of very, very strong messages that I think align with, with um, Dr. Calabatas there. First of all, again, this message of inclusion and your example of the inclusion of, of, of rural women in, in, in some of your initiatives. Secondly, the, the importance of science and data and technology and really strengthening the capabilities of, of national level research institutions and their, their links um, with each other. Um, your thirdly, your, your point about both quality food, but also food diversity, and really recognizing you know, sort of local, local foods, local traditions, and, and, and applauding and supporting those. And then fourthly, your point about policy coordination and the fact that you were working with your colleagues in the Environment Department, and I know also in the Ministry of Economics, um, you know, that we have more integration 
at the government level across different industries around food. So, so thank you for highlighting, I think, those, those important, important messages. And I would like to now move from a you know, government perspective to our, our two business colleagues and bring in another wonderful Colombian, Pilar. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, the Chief Sustainability Officer at Cargill. Pilar, from your perspective as a global food company, but operating obviously in many countries, most countries around the world, what do you see as the priorities for transforming food systems at the, at the country level? So Jane, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this event. We are delighted to be here with all of you today. And yes, we believe that the greatest opportunity to drive a more sustainable food system starts right there where our food system begins, and that is the farm and the farmer. We know that agriculture can be a force for good. Cargill believes that agriculture is how we are going to address climate change, protect the planet, and feed a growing population in a safe, sustainable, and responsible way. So how are we doing this? Let's look at what is happening within the agricultural sector across North America, where thousands of farmers and producers are adopting more sustainable practices that benefit life above and below the Earth's surface. Let's look at regenerative agriculture as an example. When farmers eliminate tillage or add cover crops to their land, not only they improve their yields, but they also become more efficient and productive, which at the end of the day, we all know it brings significant economic value to the farm. In addition to that, they perceive significant sustainability benefits like capturing carbon in the soil. The long-term benefits are significant, including improving the fertility of the land for future growing seasons. And this is why Cargill is partnering with farmers to bring these practices to 10 million acres in North America by 2030. But I talked about above and below the land. So how does it work above the land? Across areas like in the Southern Great Plains in North America, which is responsible for about a third of the beef production in the US, Ratchers are also rotating grazing practices to improve and promote biodiversity, enhance the health of the soil, and hold carbon in the soil. So for Cargill, it all begins right there with the farmer. We are also working with partners uh, such as WWF and TNC and customers like Walmart, McDonald's, and Cisco. And we are also partnering with farmers, replicating these practices and improving the sustainability of the beef supply chain all the way from the farm to the restaurant. And in summary, I, I think we have mentioned this before, no single entity or government is going to solve our food system challenges alone. We in our company believe that collaboration is a must amongst all of us who are joining uh, this these call and this event today. But also we are pleased to be a member of the Food Action Alliance. We believe this collective effort is going to drive transformation within the food system faster and at a scale. And my last comment, Jane, only by working together with farmers at the center, we are going to build a global food system that is inclusive, sustainable and resilient. No, well, thank you. Thank you for that, that Pilar. And I think, again, uh, that message of inclusion coming through so strongly of the inclusion of the farmers, but, but also, I think, sort of two of the most interesting partnership models at the country level for, for companies is with nonprofit organizations, both um, you know, food nonprofits, environmental organizations, humanitarian organizations, you know, to reach particularly the most vulnerable rural communities and vulnerable consumers, but also business to business partnerships. We talk a lot about public private partnerships, but these business to business partnerships with other food companies. Companies, but also with banks and technology companies, et cetera, which um, you, know, you, you, you touched on there. And I think a you know, key, key message for us to, to take away. And a good, good segue to you, to you, Jay, and you and your colleagues um, and your team at, at UPL have just been incredible chance now on, 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 on strengthening food systems at the national level. Yes, and thank you, Jane. Thank you. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, and uh, see everyone and good luck for the meeting this week. Um, you know, at UPL, we, we believe uh, in, in the fact that, uh, you know, farmers are a key source of uh, enablement for the world. And I think that by, by rewarding and recognizing the farmer at the center, as my panelist uh, Pilar said, uh, you can drive the biggest amount of impact towards decarbonizing the world. 
Today, um, the, you know, we are incentivizing large industrial uh, companies by rewarding them for uh, being sustainable. And, and I think uh, we need to relook at the amount of incentive and reward and recognition we are giving to the smallest farmers, smallest, uh, smallholder farmers uh, to motivate them to change practices, to improve practices and to be regenerative. This is really an exciting uh, journey at UPL. We have been working on technologies to be able to enable them. And we believe that uh, together with the government's, uh, uh, you know, organizations, uh, NGOs, and other private sector, I think if we are able to incentivize and reward uh, the smallholder farmers, it is unfortunate that, uh, you know, most people eat three times a day, uh, we are, we are, and, and the people supplying the food for us are the poorest in the world. Uh, this is a, a irony which needs to be sorted out. Uh, and it, we can't have the farmers who, who are actually the biggest industrial uh, base being, being the poorest people. So uh, it's very uh, important. I love the agenda. I love the subjects. I think working together with the governments, I think that Agnes is doing an amazing job of raising awareness for Africa, for India. You know, we at, uh, what we expect as a private sector is that the governments agreed on the priorities uh, on value chains. You know, Vietnam is an amazing example of a country which has been able to drive transformation of various value chains and become a world leader. Coffee, I think cashew, uh, fish exports. I mean, they've just done an amazing job by focusing, creating the right infrastructure training needs because a farmer needs a value chain processing and, and all those kind of things. And if, if we can get uh, various countries and uh, to focus on their priorities, uh, we should be able to deliver results much, much faster. You know, um, uh, the Food Action Alliance is an amazing uh, initiative and we are very happy to be part of that and support, uh, support it to really transform the, the uh, resilience uh, of the smallholder farmers. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's such an important subject and, uh, you know, we, with a little bit of uh, incentive and reward, we can really transform the, the carbon footprint of the world. And I think this is the easiest way to do it. Thank you. No, absolutely. No, well, thank you. And I, I think you really want to reiterate and reinforce your comment about incentives. Um, and it goes back to, you know, Agnes talking at the beginning also, we need to change mindsets and behaviors. And one of the ways to do that is incentives. And, and I think, you know, we, uh, particularly for smallholder farmers, you know, what can governments do to improve market incentives for large companies to be more inclusive and sustainable? Um, and then what can, you know, large companies do who are working with smallholder farmers, um, you know, to provide much, much sort of stronger incentives for, as you say, uh, you know, both you know, uh, production, but production that's sustainable and also incentives for more, nutri more nutritious foods. So, so, so thank you for that. And a good segue um, to um, President Hong Bao, uh, your, you and your team again have played a remarkable leadership role for many, many years, but um, you know, very much in, in the lead up to the summit. And as we go you know, through the summit and going forward, IFAD and FAO and World Food Programme will be playing a, a crucial role um, in determining the, 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 the outcomes of the summit. And so it'd be great to get your priorities on you know, what you think is you know, particularly important at the, at the country level. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, um, first of all, uh, great to, um, to see you once again. I mean, uh, um, for us, uh, all of that said and done, the, the tomorrow after the, 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 the summit, it, it, I consider that the real beginning. Uh, all we have done is uh, what do you call in Italy, the aperitivo. We, we are just preparing the ground. The real thing will start on the, as you mentioned in your introductory remark, and the leadership that we have from the country, um, from the country offices through the pathway and others. So one of the key roles that the Rome based agencies, uh, IFA, WFP, uh, FAO, uh, is, and again, with other UN agencies and uh, um, development partners, is to ensure that we adjust our, our support programs to the countries 
in moving ahead with their, their pathways. Secondly, it's going to be important for us to have a coordinated um, uh, approach and harmonized approach. Um, right now, um, we feel, and which is good news, the momentum we have created together, a very high level of momentum, um, and there's uh, so many initiatives. So it is going to be important for us to ensure that there is some kind of um, a coordinated um, um, way of addressing the different uh, dimension for the issue, both from a um, food security perspective, from um, a climate change perspective, and from the um, economic uh, uh, perspective. My, ne my next point uh, is going to be quite um, critical. Um, and then maybe I'm looking at that from specifically if I, uh, if at angle. Let, let's keep uh, in mind that when we start this whole uh, um, story of the food systems, not only is a way to really put together from the small scale producers to the um, commercial uh, um, um, food system um, um, uh, companies to ensure that this not only leads us to better nutritious food and fighting hunger, but also to provide minimum decent living income for those small scale producers. And therefore that's going to be quite critical. How do we ensure that the, this um, coffee producer um, in, 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 in Colombia, at the end of the chain, he or she has that minimum income to, um, um, to remunerate the work that and they are put there at the at the beginning at the production level. It does also uh, include that uh, not only we just um, link them up with the commercial farmers, is also bringing them also uh, as small scale producers as SMEs to do a minimum transformation, so to be able to add value to what they are producing. And my last point will be uh, linked to the uh, the the the. the climate change dimension, we know that a climate change, particularly the adaptation level, is going to be crucial. And, and, and therefore, having ways to provide the small scale and um, producers in ensuring uh, um, them that they are better um, equipped to face the, the climate change, and, and including um, extreme weather condition um, insurance, is what we want to be working with the government on the country level. The last, very last point, if I may, um, there they, they going to be, um, of course, the global engagement initiative that hopefully will continue and we have to encourage that and the national pathway at the national level and the different, the scientists and all different initiative will go on. So what the RBA colleague together with uh, other UN colleagues, we want to um, be the, um, the, the, the glue between these different and parties, so a coordinating matter where we should be able also to report back, uh, not only to the Secretary General and the Deputy Secretary General in New York, but also for us to uh, report back to the high level political forum um, every year or, 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 or every two years in New York, so to ensure that there is a sense of accountability and a momentum being kept uh, over the coming years. Um, to increase the chance of uh, achieving SDG 1 and 2 by 2030. Over to you. Great, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Gilbert. And one um, sort of quick added question there. What role do you sort of see for the development banks, you know, the World Bank, the regional development banks, you know, partnering with you on the, the means of implementation? Yeah, uh, this is going to be, um, if you look at what one thing that IFA is doing, we and together with the French uh, uh, Agence Francaise de Développement and the, uh, here in Italy, um, Casa Deposited um, Prestiri, we trying to bring together the development um, partners, the, de the, the public development bank around the world um, to really create a platform so we can put all our effort together to create a greater synergy in providing finance to this, specifically to the rural community, to the small scale, and producer, which is one. Secondly, globally, as a follow-up on the Food Systems Summit, at the end of the day, um, the, 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 the financing is not the only is, um, issue, let's be very clear, but financing 
is an essential dimension. We all know it. So we're going to need um, the, the financial institutions, the World Bank of this world, the IMF of this world, the regional development banks, trying to also come with different uh, uh, fin uh, innovation um, in financing that can be made available to the different initiatives uh, at uh, preferably at the country level, but also the research dimension so uh, that the result of the research and the, and the scientific, uh, the scientific um, perspective, the re re result of those work can be brought and scale up at the country at the country office level. And that we need the financial institution. So yes, it's uh, first of all, the public development bank that we are working on, but we, we see this bigger than just the public development bank, but the, the whole financial institution that we need to, to, to step up um, their engagement and their involvement in um, providing innovative financing, um, particularly to the, um, to the rural, uh, um, world to, to, to lift up uh, out of poverty. And I think one you know, key message I want to pull out from, from, from your comments uh, amongst many great points is about living wage and living income. And I think you're, you're talking about in the context of farmers, I think consumers as well. I think one of our biggest challenges as a global community is to realize that if you know, households do not have a living income, or living wage, the, you know, the ability to feed their families in any nutritious, healthy way is almost impossible. And so in addition to sort of having um, you know, social safety nets in times of crisis like we're currently going through, um, you know, I think getting business and governments working together on the uh, much more um, urgency on living wages and living income um, and you know, the ILO and other uh, UN agencies coming in on that is, is very important as well, both for farmers and, and consumers. So, so thank you. Well, thank you all very, very much for sort of highlighting your priorities. I think as we sort of come into, uh, starting to close up here, there's sort of five key themes sort of coming through to me at the, you know, what's, what's important at the country level. And the first is, um, you know, this overarching uh, message of inclusion. <laughs> And you know, particularly governments and business leaders and large financial institutions being very intentional about inclusion um, of you know, particularly rural communities, smallholder farmers, low-income consumers, you know, the most vulnerable people, that you know, their priorities are addressed. Secondly, the importance of policy coordination, um, you know, both between governments, but between ministries within governments, as the, as the Minister of Agriculture shared with us. And thirdly, this critical importance of evidence-based data analysis, data collection, science, technology, national research institutions and, and, and capabilities. And um, fourthly, um, you know, the enormous enabler of digitization and, and your know, digital platforms. And then fifth, I think all of you in different ways have touched on, 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 on finance and incentives and you're know, finding both your know, innovative insurance mechanisms, uh, uh, savings mechanisms, et cetera, um, as well as mobilizing multi-billion dollar finance for, 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 for infrastructure. So the you know, financial innovation being obviously a key element as well. So as we sort of move towards closing, um, I'd like to ask each of you um, just to reflect, obviously there are numerous priorities um, that you're all juggling with um, in, your, in your leadership roles, but you know, what would be Sort of one major commitment as we um, sort of move into the into the the the, the, the UN Food System Summit tomorrow, um, you know, with a focus on these country-led priority setting, country-led pathways. What would be you know one or two major commitments for you and um, you know your your institution? And Gilbert, can I come or come back to you to start with you um, on your you know major commitment as we as we lead into the into the summit. Um, that, that's a tricky question. We have so many things that we want to commit ourselves to that it's difficult to make the major one. But clearly for me is uh, to be able to re, um, redirect um, our, um, our financing, um, particularly we're starting a new cycle in, in next January to, re, to ensure that we redirect our financing to align behind the country's uh, pathway. Secondly, uh, helping the countries to scale up the investments um, that are now at the country level, so to be able to have a, a greater 
uh, impact on the different coalitions that um, they are focusing in their pathways. And, and what you sort of said earlier about you know, um, you know, public banks, but also public pension funds and others at the country level. How do we mobilize not just global finance, but, but, but um, national resources and finance at the, at the country level? Thank you. Uh, Your Excellency Minister Zia, can I come to you on you know, what would be some of the you know, major commitments and priorities for you and your colleagues? The, the Ministerio de Agricultura y Desarrollo Rural de Colombia, nosotros estamos comprometidos con la política del presidente Iván Duque de dejar la ruta para que en el 2030 disminuyamos la emisión de gases de efecto invernadero en un 51%. Para eso, hoy tenemos cadenas de producción como la palma, el cacao, el café, el arroz y la ganadería que tienen un compromiso de cero deforestación. Adicionalmente a eso, estamos creando los incentivos y las financiaciones para hacer productos verdes en la agricultura y el desarrollo rural. Y de la misma forma, eh, estamos impulsando los sellos verdes para poder de esa forma ser competitivos en las exportaciones al mundo. Thank you, and again, very, very, very important priorities. And, and I will you know, just come back to as well applauding you. And I hope every government around the world can sort of follow your your model of this interministerial cooperation around the around the food agenda. So, so, so thank you for your your leadership, Pilar. Coming to you, some key key commitments from from your side. Yeah, thank you, Jane. So from a Cargill perspective, our commitment is to those who enable our food system, more specifically, the farmers and their communities. We believe that we have to empower local farmers and communities to create their own food system to build economic opportunity and feed a growing population. I wanted to share just briefly a, an excellent example of how Cargill is doing this, and it's our partnership with the Hatching Hope Initiative. And we have a goal to uh, improve the livelihoods of about 100 million people around the world through the power of poultry farming. We have an excellent example of a young Indian woman, Maltilata Naik, who is the primary earner in her family. Her farm wasn't doing well, and she saw an excellent opportunity to come to Hatching Hope for support, for training, for things like proper housing, vaccinations. And as a result of this, the support she, the support she got from Hatching Hope and Cargill, she was able to more than quadruple the size of the farm. There are many, many women like Maltilata around the world. And we know that when they are empowered, we strengthen local economies and we remove some of the vulnerabilities and inequalities in the food system. And I know we can do this, we can do it together. Reminding us that you know, 100 million farmers, it's 100 million individual farmers and their households and individual stories, individual experiences, individual challenges, um, and you know, focusing on, on that as, as, as well as you know, the, the, the ambitious numbers. So thank you. Thank you for reminding us um, you know, of, of that importance. Jay, over to you. Thank you. Uh, no, we're very excited about a project which we're doing uh, you know, in India, about 5 million acres of rice uh, farmers uh, burn their crop uh, because they don't have time to rotate the crop. Uh, we've committed to end the crop burn. Uh, we call it end the crop burn in the next three years. So 5 million acres will stop. This year we, is the first year we launched the initiative where we are offering free service to use uh, uh, a bio enzyme to, to stop the farmers from crop burning. Uh, uh, it's a free service, 500,000 acres will uh, not burn this year and we were excited uh, for, uh, you know, almost 5 million um, acres in the next three years. So it's a very exciting project. We have a lot of commitment from um, other food companies and to classify and give traceability to uh, the pr food produced, uh, the crop produced by these farmers to be able to be, uh, uh, you know, differentiated and called sustainably grown. Uh, it's a very exciting initiative, a lot of support. We're also doing something quite innovative there. Citizens of Delhi who suffer the impact of the crop burn can contribute online 
to individual farmers and sort of give them this uh, incentive uh, to not to burn and to reward them uh, in a small way. It's not uh, a major financial commitment, but it just increases the interaction between um, um, you know, families living in Delhi and around contribute to these farmers who are changing their practices and sacrificing for a better environment. I think it brings us back to one of Agnes's opening comments on the need to change mindsets um, and that you know, we have to find more creative ways to link end you know, the producers and farmers with end consumers and, 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 and the people who are consuming um, you know, the food in cities. Um, so, so, so thank you for that example. And I think also a great example of bringing together um, you know, uh, life science technology, digital technology and financial technology with you know, capability building at the level of the farmer that you, know, you as a large company partnering with others can do. So, 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 so thank you. And finally, Agnes, back to you with some you know, closing comments on you know, what, what, you know, what will you feel at the end of tomorrow in terms of you know, major commitment and priority going forward? Well, thank you. I mean, <clears throat> I was prepared to answer the same question you asked everybody else. So, <laughs> so I'm definitely looking to, first of all, closing on that, ensuring that tomorrow uh, we have a great summit, all of us, and uh, uh, we are already uh, beginning on a very good note with uh, the commitment from the U.S. government yesterday of $10 billion to, to uh, commit to end to hunger, but also then with the commitment from private sector yesterday of $345 million under the leadership of Lawrence Haddad uh, that um, the private sector is, is putting on the table. So if we continue with that tone, I'm, I'm just thinking that if 10 more countries came forward uh, the way the US did, we would have the budget we need to end hunger in the next 10 years. So really uh, a, a very good start. Uh, in addition to that, of course, <clears throat> is working with the RBS to ensure that we transition this work to the RBS and, and make sure that uh, they can continue. And then I go back to my day job which their job is going to be to ensuring that uh, the commitments that the African uh, countries have made in their pathways can be translated into investment plans. And I'm focused on making sure that in the next two years at least, we have investment plans from about 30 countries that are ready to go, that give uh, institutions like IFA the place to invest money and, and institutions like Jeshla a, a place to invest their money. So. I'm excited to see, to take this whole perspective of the summit back to the continent and get to work. Great, no, well, thank you. Thank you so much, Agnes, and thank you again for your, your truly remarkable leadership and, and to all of you for your, 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 your leadership. And I think a very strong call to action there for all of us, you know, how do governments make specific time-bound pledges and commitments? How can we get more companies to pledge, whether it's a zero hunger pledge or other, other, other pledges? And you know, what can each of us do as individuals you know, to support uh, nonprofit organizations and other initiatives that are focused on making food systems more inclusive and sustainable? Um, and resilient and, and nutritious and healthy. And I think as we move forward, three sort of closing comments for me, um, you know, what sort of at the country level, it's absolutely clear that um, you know, country-led uh, leadership is, is, is where we need to go. And I sort of take away sort of three themes. One, investment plans. You know, how do we take these commitments into very specific national investment plans led by ministers like uh, Minister Zeo and his colleagues in, in each country, but working with business, working with local pension funds, development banks, et cetera, on, on how to implement those, those investment plans in specific value chains that are priorities that are identified at the country level. Secondly, clearly innovation. <laughs> And, I, and I, it's been, and we've had great examples here today, innovation and, and policy um, engagement and, and you know, cross-ministerial cooperation, innovation and financing mechanisms, innovation in technologies, and um, you know, very much innovation in, in, in partnership building and, and innovation in business models and taking a, an innovation mindset and the concept of innovation hubs um, forward together with sort of national level investment plans and priorities, I think is the second you know, key theme that, that uh, has, has come through in many months, but also today. And then thirdly, very importantly, the message of inclusion and being so intentional 
around including you know, both farmers and consumers, particularly um, you know, uh, you know, remote rural communities, lower income farmers and, and consumers and, and the most vulnerable um, in any focus on building more sustainable and resilient and, and healthy um, food systems. So country level investment plans, innovation and the concept of innovation hubs and a very, very sort of strong focus on, on inclusion. So thank you and I, I think it's very exciting the fact we've got 63 countries who have already put forward pathways. So uh, yeah, at least 63 investment plans already in the, in the making thank and, you. Um, and you know, look thank forward to taking you. it together. Is it, is it more than 63 already? 93. 93. 93. 96, sorry, 93. Thank you. Thank you, Agnes. Thank you. 93 countries so, and, and counting. And, and many pledges coming from companies as well. So, so thank you very, very much to our panelists. And I'd like to now hand over to Sean DeClean from the World Economic Forum to close us off. Sean. Thank you very much. Um, as a member of the Executive Committee of the World Economic Forum, on whose behalf I just would like to thank the moderator, Jay Nelson, uh, who together with a fantastic panel today, I just think really brought this to life. Uh, so, so well done. I mean, what the, the panel, at least for me, really articulated is what we can definitely expect from the summit is, is a united message from countries on their rapidly adopting a food systems approach at the individual country level and how important it's going to be for the international community moving forward to be supporting those country pathways for food system transformation. So well done and, and very energetic and powerful uh, message that came through and the forum along with the Food Action Alliance and other coalitions for action is just very keen to support this process, offering its platform for leaders from all sectors, from business, government, civil society, international organizations, as a scale accel accelerator in support of food systems transformation. So I hope everyone got as much out of this panel today as I did, but thank you very much.